fly it out. Excuse me? Why? I want whatever, whatever you were smoking, I want that. <laughs> oh, my mic's off here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hold on, please cut the camera before we jack with it any further. Yeah. yeah, right. I think we captured all that on the mic. You're like, no, you're reenacting the duel. Right. With real guns. Yes. Yes. No, no, it's not. You're not. It's like sitting in front of a vanity mirror or something. We're just kind of. All right, let's begin. This is the Thursday, October 19, 2017 meeting of the Ann Arbor Area Transportation Authority Board of Directors. A quorum is present and we'll begin. Uh, opening items 1A, can I have somebody move to approve our agenda? Uh, before we uh, move to approve the agenda, I'd like to make one, um, actually, yeah, one um, change. Uh, we have a guest speaker today. Paul Adjaba from MDOT, and I would like to, out of courtesy from our guest, move item 4A and have it become item 2B. So just move him up in the agenda. Any objection to that? Okay. Any other changes or possible amendments to the agenda? Can I have somebody move the agenda then as amended? Mr. Alamein, seconded by Mr. Cree. All those in favor of the agenda as amended? Any dis opposed? Thank you. Uh, item 1B, public comment. Anybody from the public who wants to comment? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, my name is Tim Hall. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor. I've been here for a while, though I moved away for a few years, but moved back. Anyway, I was just wanting to comment on the US 23 Express bus. I'm kind of excited that they're finally going to try this, because I know they've been talking about rail, rail, rail for like 10 years, but they haven't even tried so much as a bus service out there. I'm kind of happy to see them actually doing that. and. From there, we can kind of see, I mean, there might be some people who ride rail that wouldn't ride a bus, but we could see like what the demand is out in that corridor and kind of like seeing this as a pilot service and it kind of fits nicely with the other A2 Express services, though this might be different due to the MDOT involvement. But anyway, I mean, my one comment was I noticed that uh, like the other A2 Express routes, the stops are Central Campus and the hospital. And I'm wondering, why does North Campus always get left out? 
And I kind of feel like it just wouldn't seem like on either this or the existing route, which is kind of going off topic, it'd be good to include North Campus. I feel like there's a lot of people there, and with this North Campus Research Complex, they're expanding it. And uh, that was just the one comment I would like to make regarding that this service and the commuter services in general. Thank you. Any other comments? We'll move on then to item 1C, announcements. Any announcements from any members of the board or notifications? <coughs> uh, I have one. Uh, I think we've been notified of it, but uh, just so people can save it on their calendars and hold the date, uh, January 24th at the Hilton Garden Inn for our board retreat, uh, which will be open to the public as well. So please hold that on your calendar. Any others? We'll move on then to item 2A, a, our consent items. Uh, approval from minutes from September 28th. Can I have somebody move those into the record? Okay, Cairo, seconded by Eli. All those in favor of the minutes, raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? We have two abstentions, Jack and Larry. Those passed, thank you. Uh, so item 2B and to the amended agenda, that would be our speaker for the evening, Paul Adjiba from MDOT, who's going to talk to us about that very US 23 express bus project. And I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'll dispense with the suspense. I am not Paul Algeba. Uh, uh, I am, in fact, uh, Mr. Carpenter. I'm the CEO. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul to join me in just a moment, but I want to warm this up and tee it up uh, for the board and, and for Paul, and then I'll ask him forward to say a few words. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, the question uh, in front of us is about a new uh, bus service, an express bus service to a park and ride lot up US 23 north of Ann Arbor to this, uh, towards uh, Ypsil, uh, excuse me, Livingston County. It's this new tongue. I'm still uh, breaking it in. So uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this particular agenda item before I get into the meat of the subject, uh, this section of the agenda is uh, strategy updates. And in the discussions of policy governance moving forward, I think there was a recognition the policy governance is very good with what we call the rear view mirror monitoring, the looking back over the previous period to see how things have gone. But there was interest from the board in looking forward. How are things coming uh, before, uh, before things happen? How do we have a chance to have uh, an opportunity for feedback or to provide advice? And this is a great example of, of how this part of the agenda uh, is going to be working uh, going forward. This is the first real project uh, that we've had the opportunity to bring forward uh, to test out this part of the agenda. So uh, the intent here is to provide an initial outline of this project uh, to you this afternoon and to seek your advice and feedback. Um, provide any additional information if we can. And we have a, a month or two uh, to discuss this, so it's not uh, urgent, urgent. Um, and try to get some clarity around the proposals and the commitments uh, necessary for this project. So quick background, as our public speaker said just a moment ago, uh, the 23, US 23 corridor north of Ann Arbor towards uh, Livingston County has been the subject of study for some time uh, as a higher level of service transit corridor. This was previously done under the Wally North-South Rail study. That study has concluded, and one of its findings was um, that, this pro that this corridor might be suitable uh, for a pilot project for express bus service, that that might be a good start moving in the direction of the greater vision of the Wally. Um, around about New Year's, uh, MDOT and Mr. Ajiba approached us um, to let us know that uh, the Michigan DOT would be building a fairly large park and ride lot <clears throat> near on US 23, near Eight Mile Road, and they requested our assistance. Uh, if this parking lot uh, has the capacity to help move, particularly workers, towards Ann Arbor, uh, would the Ann Arbor community and the ride in particular uh, be able to assist? Uh, we considered this, and we noted that it did seem to advance the board's ends policy 
of improving access to destinations for workers. Certainly others are included there, but it absolutely has a, 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 um, a direct impact for commuters and workers. Um, we believe the project may be viable, but that does not mean there are no risks. There are certainly uncertainties uh, or, uh, excuse me, inherent uncertainties about ridership, about operational performance in a congested highway corridor. All of that is understood. Um, but we think that there is some viability worth moving forward with a pilot project. So I'd speak about that. The conceptual service plan that has emerged is a, uh, a description of a service that is contracted, not uh, running our own buses, for example, with highway coaches, which is suitable for the speeds and distances we're talking about. We're thinking four trips in, four trips out, peak direction, primarily on weekdays with the stops, uh, primarily, as noted before, the hospital and the Blake Transit Center. We're also including uh, service on football game days because we think there's a potential market uh, there as well. Uh, we see it as probably being a two to three year pilot project with an annual cost of five to $600,000 strictly operational uh, dollars. There is no capital uh, in our concerns at this moment. I'll speak a little bit about the funding proposal that's being developed. It's split between the, the capital costs and the operating costs. Uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation has graciously offered to carry a significant cost uh, for the park and ride lot. And Paul will speak more to that, but I believe the dollar amount is in excess of a million dollars. This is a significant capital investment, and we certainly appreciate that as it is very much geared towards, I think, the Ann Arbor market. Operations um, would be funded primarily from a CMAQ grant. Uh, that is our hope, anyway. Um, you may recall in your 2018 budget, there were a couple of projects I drew your attention to in the back, one of which was this project, and it had zero dollars assigned to it. That intent continues to hold here that uh, we've been clear with, with MDOT and other interested parties that the ride is not in a position at this time to be able to um, support operating costs. Uh, we might be able to donate some staff time in a contract oversight role. That seems uh, to be something we have the capacity to do. Um, but we will be moving forward to apply for CMAQ funding. CMAQ is a federal competitive grant. Uh, it's shorthand for the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality uh, service And, of course, we're in discussions with others about the possibility of other sources of funding as well. Some considerations uh, for all of us, I think, going into this. Uh, if we have a pilot project, how will we judge success? There are a number of criteria we could use. Uh, ridership is probably one of the most important. Uh, cost recovery and financial performance. Its impact on congestion in the US 23 corridor. Of course, political and public support is, is, is fundamental to the ongoing support for a project like this, and simply available funding. Uh, that may not be so much a performance criteria, but is a necessary step uh, if the project were to move forward. As with any project, there are some inherent risks. Um, the risks of underperformance, which I'm sure some have wondered about, are not actually that high. It's a pilot project, and if uh, 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 it doesn't actually turn out to be viable due to low ridership, the project simply ends and the service folds and that's that. Um, a risk on the flip side of that we should consider is the possibility of being what I call a victim of our own success. Uh, we have 180 parking stalls, four buses will carry about that many people plus a little bit. What happens if they fill up really fast? What happens if there's demand for more? Uh, this is a very popular corridor with probably tens of thousands of trips uh, a day. So that is a possibility. Cost overruns then become our number one concern in making sure that cost control is very strong. Uh, if the project is successful, it will need operating funding to be continued. And I will be straight with you that no source of that funding has yet been identified. So if we go into this with a CMAC grant as a pilot project, and it is successful, and there is a desire to continue it, there will need to be a community conversation about how will that occur. I'm hopeful that seeing a successful demonstration in this corridor might be enough to convince um, uh, potential funding partners uh, that it is worth uh, their time and energy and resources. As I mentioned before, we do have an exit strategy. Simply, if the project is not successful, we'll run until the money is out, and then we will uh, close up shop and move on to the next, uh, next opportunity. Timeline, so we're all on the same page. CMEC grant applications are due um, in early November. Uh, don't worry about that. We have time beyond that 
uh, to, to continue to uh, enhance our proposals and, if necessary, pull back. Uh, the final deadline is in late November. Likely award notifications are in the first quarter of next year. Um, we would have a procurement process for a contractor that would need to occur. The parking lot with MDOT, last I spoke uh, to Paul, uh, suggested fall of 18. He's nodding, so okay, I'm not wrong. Uh, we would like to be able to open bus service uh, there as well. Uh, one risk I'd like to back up and mention that I've neglected to put in the slide I think is important. Uh, CMAC applications are a competitive process. There's no guarantee we'll get the money. So we're going to put our hat in the ring and we're going to see if we can do it. I think we have a strong proposal. I believe there is support uh, in the region for it. Every transit agency in the greater Detroit area traditionally will get their number one project approved. If there is any money left over, that might be distributed to the transit agencies again. We will have two CMAC grants, one of which will simply be for bus replacement. This is very important to our capital plan, which was part of our budget. So going forward, we will prioritize that grant first. If there is money left over, we will aggressively pursue this one, but there is no guarantee we would get both. And if we are forced to choose, I, I must say that we will have to prioritize the agency's immediate capital needs over this project. With that in closing, um, this is a great opportunity to test drive this part of the agenda. I am proactively seeking your advice as part of this process. I'd like to know what thoughts you would have to be very policy governance for a moment. Do the results, beneficiaries, and costs seem appropriate to you? Is this what you meant when you wrote your ENDS policies? Do you have any advice for us on how to uh, improve excuse me, the proposal? Is there any more information that would be helpful for you in providing advice? And again, part of this is being confident as a group going forward before uh, staff move on a delegated responsibility to make sure you're aware of it and have an opportunity to provide some feedback and advice. With that, I'd like to ask Mr. Ajiba to say a few words. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, first, let me commend Matt. Since uh, the first time I mentioned this to him about two years ago when he came on board, we've worked extremely hard to get to this point. Uh, we started the discussion about this project, as I said, about three years ago when we decided we we're going to try to do some improvements on that US-23 corridor. So you know, on that corridor on a daily basis, we have over 60,000 vehicles driving through that corridor. And it is such a congested area that the, the two lanes that we have out there right now is just not enough to, uh, to take the number of, uh, the volume of traffic that comes uh, north and south on a daily basis. So we invested some money in that corridor. As you all know, we're building a, a flex route project out there, the first one in the, in the state. Uh, we're very confident that it's, it's going to work very well. Uh, if you remember about three, two years ago when I came to talk to the board, I mentioned that part of our strategy is that we look at this as a three-legged stool. Um, the improvement we're making right now, the Wally project, if that ever comes online, and also the possibility of running a bus service along that corridor. Again, the overall objective is to get as much uh, vehicle off that road as possible, let them use alternative uh, uh, ways to get into and out of downtown. So with that, this is another leg of that stool. Uh, we are in negotiation right now to purchase about five acres of land out there on that eight mile uh, borderline between Washington and uh, Livingston County. The idea is that uh, our initial investment will put about 180 uh, space parking lot there uh, with bus pad and all the uh, things we need to, to uh, accommodate buses from being able to get in and out of there. It's quite an investment for us. We picked that site for two reasons. One, it's on the uh, RL Bank study as one of the locations for the Wally uh, station. So we figured, okay, if we locate it there, it could be jointly used when Wally ever comes online. And two, the reason why we are negotiating a five-acre lot is also if the demand is there, we'll be able to expand it. So what we're doing right now is hopefully right-sizing the lot to see how 
successful it will be, as Matt said, if uh, we may end up being a victim of our own success. If this gets to be uh, uh, in high demand, we may have to uh, look to invest more money in uh, expanding that lot down the road. So uh, we, we're very excited about this. We really think it's going to work. Uh, we, we've put a lot of money in that corridor, and what I would ask is uh, your support. I mentioned to Matt that you know putting the uh, CMAC grant together, we're certainly going to be, MDOT's going to be hand in hand with AATA to uh, do whatever we can to, s to see that we're successful. I really think it's, it's worth trying this pilot and, and, and see if it's, if it's the right thing to do or not. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Questions from the board for Matt or Paul? Mike. Uh, if for whatever reason the AATA cannot get the funding or for another reason, uh, I presume that lot could have some other use in terms of park and riding someplace? That, that is correct. We are at a decision point right now where part of our design decisions have to be, are we going to put a bus pad there? If it's, if it's not going to be used for uh, busing people in and out, it changes some of our des the design parameters, like the, the size of the radius of the opening, the, the bus pad, and a whole lot of other things. That, those are some costs that we will probably have to pull back from uh, expanding if we didn't need to do that. Others? Eli? So I appreciate, um, it's great to see this um, emphasis on transit on a heavily used corridor. A uh, question comes up regarding CMAC funding. It's my understanding that CMAC is a federally funded program and a portion of the CMAC funds that accrue to the state of Michigan are uh, sub-allocated to the MPOs like SEMCOG for distribution equally among transit and roadways and that there's a statewide CMAC funding pool. And the question that I have is in the context of we have MDOT support, if all of the transit operations in southeastern Michigan uh, consume the regional allocation, it, Matt, have you had conversation with MDOT whether, uh, if there are no regional or local CMAC monies available to support this demonstration service, would MDOT look to the statewide CMAC pool to provide the support necessary to move this project forward? Paul invited uh, myself and uh, our deputy CEOs uh, to Lansing uh, several months ago. And I think we had a very productive exploratory conversation, I think, with uh, the MDOT personnel closest to um, those grant uh, pots. And I would characterize that as a very good initial conversation. I cannot say I have a commitment uh, along the lines you just outlined, but that is definitely something uh, that we identified then and uh, we continue to be hopeful for <coughs> now. I don't know if Paul has anything to add, any newer information. Just uh, two quick questions about the, the oper more so about the operations or flexibility in operations. So the presentation talked about four uh, trips in each direction. I assume that would be four inbound in the AM peak. Would that be a correct or fair assumption? Yes. And in our current express service, is that limited to two from Canton and Chelsea? So this would be a higher uh, number of trips from this park and ride than our existing express services. Um, I believe that may be the case. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, given it's unknown, although we hear substantial uh, vehicular volumes on the card, whether there's the possibility, unless marketing and surveying already tells us, to phase this in as a demonstration, initiating with two, and then if and when we have the problem of oversubscription, we're able to expand. So I think it's a contracting matter, contract for all four, but phase it in. Uh, which leads me to, you know, I appreciate the, the math related to 180 spaces and how many seats on the buses. 
we have other lines of business. We have van ride, we support carpooling or ride sharing. And the question I have is what type of van and ride sharing promotions are we anticipating? Uh, because whether we have 50 people on a bus or whether we have eight people on a van, those are fewer vehicles that will be traveling the corridor, benefiting MDOT, the commuters of the state, as well as the end destinations here in Ann Arbor or elsewhere in our community. So I just w uh, appreciate that somebody might be saying, hey, we've got enough seats, we can fill it up with bus patrons, but I know we have multiple lines of business and there may be times when people would want a car or van pool that whether it's two or four round trips we offer, uh, that we may need spaces for these alternative modes of transport to have capacity. Any information you can share on that would be appreciated. Certainly. Um, I don't believe there's anything on the MDOT uh, uh, goals for this project that preclude carpools or van pools. I think they're very welcome in absolutely. the lot. Um, the, I, so I, and yes, Mr. Cooper is absolutely correct. We, we also administer uh, those programs. I think that's a great suggestion. We actually hadn't thought about weaving them into the project in the way you suggested. Thank you. I've written that down. It's excellent advice. Um, I also appreciate the thought about maybe going in a little lower on the cost, uh, supplement it with the van pool, ride pool as a way of perhaps reducing upfront risk or, or mitigating that problem. Those are excellent suggestions. Thank you. I think we'll have to take those into consideration. <coughs> Others? Jillian. Um, thanks. I also had a question related to the CMAC funding. Um, my understanding is that there is sort of a, a pool of CMAC funding that comes through to the Detroit area agencies. Um, and so to, to a certain extent, where, while this is a competitive grant, we're, we're counting on a certain amount of funding to come in. Um, so in terms of costs, I would like to know what the, what the trade-offs are. What are we currently funding with um, any additional CMAC money uh, that, that might be traded for this? Hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give John a little eyeball there, warm him up if I get this wrong. Um, my belief is inherent in the 2018 budget is an assumption that we will be pursuing CMAC funding, as I said, for uh, bus replacements to help finance our, excuse me, fund our capital plan, uh, again, focused on, on keeping the buses going. Uh, if we're successful for that and more money is available, as I said, we go forward with this one. If the question is what would we forego out of our existing budget if we wanted to do this in the absence what, of CMAC What have funding? we funded with CMAC in the past mm -hmm. that um, is either having to find other funding sources or um, potentially has, has reduced its cost and allowed us to use the grant money for this project? I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. Uh, other than to say the assumption in the 2018 plan going forward, I just reiterate and repeating myself, uh, is to pursue that funding for capital replacement. Um, perhaps we could get back to you and the board yeah, with that information. Yeah, I would love to have uh, an answer to that at, at a future meeting. Um, I, I'm also curious about the fare pricing model and if any conversation has been had about fares. Um, I know that has come up with a number of our express bus services and uh, I'm wondering if there's been progress toward um, a model or a system for defining what our fares are and uh, what the progress has been on that? There have been no uh, conversations to date yet on the fares for this specific service. Uh, we simply haven't gotten to that point with developing the cost proposals. Um, with regard to outstanding questions about our fare structure and policy, I'm happy to report that the RFP for the fare study is on the street. Um, It is due back to us uh, from proponents in mid-November, and we hope to begin the project in January. So that, I think, gives us a sort of a comprehensive opportunity to look at the entirety of the fare structure um, as, as, a, as, a, as a single thing. Um, uh, we have also been continuing to have some uh, uh, thinking about an outstanding question with the Ypsilanti Township Express bus service. Um, I believe the service plan is progressing uh, appropriately 
and Mr. Krieg and I have had some uh, off uh, uh, some some conversations by email about some potential suggestions that might help us resolve that particular fair issue. Although I we haven't finished that conversation, I think we have ways to go on that one, uh, but we have continued that conversation. Thanks. I hope that answers the question. It, it does. Um, and my last question, I think, is uh, I'm curious when I uh, when uh, <coughs> We discussed this a couple years ago. Um, my understanding at that time, and, and maybe I misinterpreted this, was that MDOT was planning on building the park and ride and that um, AATA would be responsible for um, ongoing maintenance and operation of the park and ride. Um, I'm curious if that is still the case and what kinds of costs we might anticipate going forward. Okay. We haven't, Paul. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> To tell you how far we've come with this project, we started our very first initial meeting with AATAs. Uh, AATA will buy the lodge, you build it, you maintain it, you operate it, and all that, right? And uh, AATA, you no, know, we're not going to do that. So we came back and said, okay, we feel very strongly about this project. We think it's the right thing to do. We'll buy the lodge, we'll build it, you operate and maintain it, right? AATA said, ah, no. So we're at a point now where I think we've, we've demonstrated a good faith effort that we really think it, it's a very good and important project for the corridor. We've decided we, we're going to buy the property, we're going to build it. The question is if AAT is going to run buses, then it obviously adds to the cost of how, uh, what we put out there, right? Then we'll say, well, okay, we'll maintain it. You operate buses in and out. So that's, that's where we are. I mean, Seems like we've come 75, 80 percent, and we're just trying to get ATA to meet us in that 25 percent. Just come to us, and I think that that's where we are now. I, <laughs> I, I think this is the last offer, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sue? Um. Well, first of all, I think it's exciting and really appreciate the initiative from MDOT. And I think um, opportunities for congestion mitigation of all types. We've been talking kind of about a spectrum here, and I think all of them working together are going to be important for us. I was just um, going back over the slides uh, that M Matt kind of talked us through, and under funding, the uh, 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 CMAC is listed, AAATA, and others. So I just want to make the point that um, what I think I heard is that you're exploring that as one source, but you're also continuing other opportunities. And um, <coughs> I think it's important we recognize that it's a, it's a dynamic uh, environment, right? And so whether we phase, which may be a great, a great idea, or there are other um, creative funding opportunities, the outcome of getting congestion mitigation and trying to reduce those trips on 23 is fantastic. So um, <coughs> I really appreciate the effort, and I'm glad that you brought it to us as an update, because uh, I think this is going to get all of us kind of <coughs> thinking about it and, and looking at other opportunities. Um, so I think uh, I think there are some good uh, good benefits worth exploring. Lots of options. Uh, the other comment I just wanted to make was to the gentleman who spoke during public comments about North Campus. I, I uh, am grateful that he brought that up uh, because we often. Uh, do not have a community that thinks about the service uh, needs that we have for North Campus. So it's really refreshing when someone brings forward advocacy for uh, destinations on North Campus. And certainly it's an important campus to the university and the uh, population there continues to just grow and densify. So really appreciated that point. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Larry? Uh, yeah, I, I also have been very impressed with uh, MDOT's willingness to uh, persist with this and, uh, and meet us uh, where we need to, uh, to be uh, when the uh, proposal
proposal first came up, I was quite concerned about uh, the cost of uh, uh, maintaining a lot uh, out there and also uh, running the buses. Um, but I believe that with the uh, uh, willingness of MDOT to both purchase and maintain the lot, uh, you know, some very, <coughs> some very uh, serious concerns have been uh, alleviated. The, um, uh, there's still the, the one concern that I've had is the, uh, the fact that the uh, uh, congestion on the highway is partly the result of traffic backing up from uh, uh, inadequate street system within Ann Arbor to handle the volume of traffic that's expected to go there. So uh, there, there is likely to be some residual congestion and I will be very interested to hear how the uh, ridership uh, grows as this project goes <coughs> forward. Um, but uh, I think uh, from my perspective, the, uh, the major objections that uh, or concerns that I had have been uh, met and I'll be happy to support this. Thank you. Others? Prashant. Thanks for the presentation. I was just, I just want to know a little bit more about, I guess, stepping back. Um, how do you see what the actual problem is? You mentioned that it's, you know, giving, I guess it's giving riders an option instead of driving in congestion. But the buses won't be operating in its own dedicated lanes, correct? So the buses will be also in that congestion, assuming that I would think that if it's two or four buses, <coughs> there might not be a, an appreciable change to the congestion on 23, I, I would guess. Um, how, if, if you haven't formulated this yet, I'm just wondering where do you think the metrics for success are gonna come from? And how will you know that this will be, how will you know that this pilot project is successful and that it should continue? In my experience, um, you find where the water is running and you stand in the middle of it if you want to get wet. Um, this is uh, like that old saying, um, the 23 is a, is a rushing river of travelers who are heading to a couple of key locations uh, in downtown Ann Arbor. So it makes it tempting from a transit perspective because there's uh, congestion, yes, but there's also the parking constraint on on our end of it in terms of when they get the car here, where do they go? Um, I do believe we would see some level of congestion reduction if we pull cars off the road. I know many board members are familiar with the concept of triple convergence and that that um, relief of congestion may, may be temporary, uh, that is possible. Um, but looking back to the board's ends of increasing access to destinations, uh, I believe that this sort of fits in uh, to that realm. I know there have been concerns in the past about the operational performance and on-time reliability if the buses are in that traffic, um, not in a dedicated lane, and Paul and I had a frank conversation at the very beginning. Um, and MDOT has indeed come a long way, uh, but I think we both agreed that uh, HOV lanes or any sort of dedicated facility is probably on the other side of a successful pilot project like this. You have to start somewhere uh, to have a proof of concept. Um, I think the primary criteria of success is going to revolve around ridership, I'll be honest. Um, how full is that lot and how fast? How full are the buses? Are we undersubscribed or oversubscribed? Uh, I think that will tell us a lot. Um, the market is already there in many cases. Um, unlike some places where the travel demand is maybe smaller or unclear um, and you have to build a market. The market here is already there on 23 every morning. So uh, it's just a question of is the product we're offering, a, a high-end highway coach, reclining seats, comfortable overhead lights, Wi-Fi, that sort of experience, albeit moving in mixed traffic, is that product 
uh, attractive enough to get people out of their cars. That product also includes not having to pay for parking on the downstream end. Uh, there is no attempt to charge for parking at this parking lot uh, here. So uh, those, I think, the major criteria is going to be ridership and, and how many people use it. Uh, as I mentioned in the slides, that's also the biggest inherent uncertainty in the project is uh, we're not familiar with uh, a park and ride oriented highway coach uh, served service like this in the state of Michigan. Uh, so it's hard to look at another performing operating service and <coughs> compare our expected performance to that. Uh, we can look further afield, but those uh, examples usually become more tenuous. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think ridership is going to be the make or break thing for this. Others? Jack? <coughs> All right, I, I have a gaggle of unsophisticated questions, um, and I'll, I'm hoping that they're quick. Uh, let's start where most people in the room expect I will start, and I'm just wondering if we can talk a little bit about the accessibility of this service. All of the vehicles used will be 100% ADA compliant, equipped with uh, wheel, uh, wheelchair lifts. Uh, the service would meet all our normal accepted uh, expected requirements in that area. Great, Th thanks. I just, you know, I've got to get that on the record. Um, so, how many people are, are in, will, will be able to travel on each bus? Without knowing the specific equipment that the contractor, without, well, that we would ask the contractor to use, a highway coach usually holds between 50 to 60 seats. Mm -hmm. um, it is usually not practical to accommodate standees on those buses, so 60 times 4, um, 240. Right, so you uh, see where I'm going with this. So 240 <coughs> with a parking lot that has 180. So I, I just am wondering how that, if we're thinking about full buses, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how that works. And let me just combine that query with another question, which is when we think about the park and ride lot, is there a convenient way for someone who doesn't have a vehicle to get there? The answer to the first question, I refer back to Mr. Cooper's uh, observation about the potential for carpooling. Uh, to you know, to be a transportation wonk, what's the average occupancy of each vehicle? If it's 1.1, uh, that might fill the bus or come close. Um, uh, so that, again, remains to be seen how, how viable that will be in this uh, unknown environment. With regards to how would people access uh, the bus otherwise, um, I'm not sure there would be any other means other than passenger okay. transportation vehicles. There, this is a very rural area. There are no sidewalks. It has a rural road cross section, with, you know, road, very small shoulder, ditch. Um, so this is not a pedestrian oriented environment. It is not in proximity to any activity centers. We have had some conversations with Northfield Township and they're very excited. This is their territory. Mm -hmm. They see a lot of potential for some sort of spin-off development here. So that if the proof of concept works, there might be some opportunities there. I think um, what's sometimes called kiss and ride uh, might be an option. Bye, honey you know, drop off kind of thing, that might be uh, uh, a potential. But I think we'd probably score pretty low on that criteria. I, I use that, that that form of transportation a lot. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I don't want anyone to have the impression that I'm not uh, looking at this uh, favorably. And I know I'm asking questions that are tending to bring out what appear to be wrinkles, but I, uh, I just I think it's worth having this uh, discussion. Um, <coughs> do, have we collected? any data about that, that tells us whether we're likely to be filling these buses, that four buses is the right amount, that do, do we have any sort of information that has sort of, other than that we know this is a substantial artery? Um, honestly, we're still working to gather that. As I mentioned, it's, it's hard to make a comparison because mm -hmm. this is the first time anyone's tried something in this corridor. There's no baseline data to compare to. Um, I remember when we first suggested this uh, at a steering committee meeting for the North-South Rail project well over a year ago, um, some of the officials uh, from municipalities up that way immediately assumed that I was speaking about using one of our own low floor <laughs> urban vehicles <laughs> in this corridor and they had a very negative perception right off the hop, hard plastic seat, 
you know, loud, rattly, that sort of thing. Those aren't um, our buses. <laughs> they speak to what they know. Yes. Uh, I corrected their uh, impression of our equipment, but then also mentioned, have you thought about a high, high a, a higher level of service with a high-end highway coach? And clearly the speaker didn't know what I was talking about. He had never ridden that type of service until I said, have you seen the air ride service? Because that bus goes up US 23 in that quarter. Oh, that. And you could see the light bulbs. Oh, OK. Um, so uh, we are still trying to find a good database uh, to base it on. Um, what we really have to go with right now to anchor it uh, before we have uh, real world experience experience driven data is we know the size of the parking lot we know how many seats or buses it would be required to carry that many people we know the volume of traffic heading up and down uh, US 23 the art and science of ridership estimation in the middle there is something we're still working on but no I wouldn't say we've done strict surveys in this corridor to, to do a market penetration the benchmarking analysis. with other you know similar efforts in other places similar populations I mean still working on that. okay yeah any, anyway um, just just a few more and then I, I will be done um, as, as we're as we're thinking about doing this like the, we talked about the metrics being ridership and one of the things that I I wonder about is um, whether there will be some initial excitement um, and then some disappointment because you can't get on the bus. You know, you thought you'd be able to get on and you, and you showed up there and now you, now you can't. Um, or someone drops you off and you can't, and you can't get on. Um, and I'm just, and then what'll happen is ridership will, will pull back. If it doesn't feel like it's predictable and, and reliable, then I'm less likely to build it into my morning regime. So I'm, um, I'm wondering, how, how we're thinking about that? The strict answer to that is we're considering uh, pre-sale tickets, uh, not walk-ups uh, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so as with the air ride service, and you'll hear me refer to that because that may be an operational model that we're familiar with, and we have some sense of comparing that to this, um, walk-ups are possible if a seat exists. Those seats are pre-booked online, and we expect that sort of system might work best in this environment. Um, highway coaches, I have used them in the past, and they can be fabulous vehicles in many applications. Uh, standees are a real problem. Yes. Uh, you can rig a bus uh, to run with standees, but it is not advisable. Uh, I am not 100% sure of its legality in Michigan. Uh, so uh, controlling the, um, the number of riders in advance would be important. So I don't think we would disappoint walk-ups but we might, if we're a victim of our own success, disappoint people who go to book and find that they can't use it. Um, I would love to have that problem, uh, uh, but then we would have to grapple with that. Which, I mean, and, and th that just poses a, a problem for at least some percentage of riders who would be interested in this because we talked about parking. Well, if you end up having to buy a blue pass for the days that you don't get the bus, um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of undermines the value of that Blue Pass and whether you'll be able because Ann Arbor is a disaster um, uh, when it comes to parking. So I mean, not that I would know, but um, well, Paul, did you yeah. want to respond to that too? Did you uh, no, that's fine. I, I think uh, Matt captured it well. I was going to say part okay. of the strategy is to have a sign like this, uh, electronic yes. sign out there on the freeway, letting people know how many spaces available when the next bus is coming. So if it's full, you don't have to get off the freeway you can keep going so we it's we, we put a lot of thoughts into this and yes. your, your questions are all very valid questions so. I really I love that slide It's my favorite slide because of that because I think it is helpful for people if they want predictability and reliability exactly. it's it's valuable to have that information online and mm -hmm. and and there um, <coughs> my, my last question and again I realize I'm a ray of sunshine here tonight but um, is what happens if a bus breaks down we have four what what is there is there a kind of a backup plan? Board members are expected. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you were in the big bucks. Um, <laughs> uh, 
responsibility for the stability of the service would be uh, the responsibility of the contractor, and we would monitor that. Okay. Um, in Air Ride's early days, um, uh, we did occasionally pull one of our buses into service. Um, mm -hmm. That has not been necessary, I know, in the time I've been here. Um, mm -hmm. But I think before that, uh, it was also not common anymore. Um, I think we would build that into the contract. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you for indulging my uh, rapid fire set of questions. Yes. Mike, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions that go back to the key uh, factor of ridership. Um, and Matt, you had said we really don't yet have a basis for saying what the ridership potential is. And that's still a work in progress, I guess. I, I was thinking, of course, that's not only important <laughs> for your planning, for the rides planning, but that I would think could be, a, a, if, if there was a good solid basis that could be presented in um, grant applications, I would think that would be very helpful in a grant application, particularly for the operating expenses. Um, Mike is absolutely correct. Uh, CMAC is in part based on your ability to reduce uh, air pollution and it is inherently built on, I think it's explicitly built on, how many, car, how, many, how many cars did you take off the road? <laughs> there is an actually prescribed formula that we will need to submit along with our application to demonstrate that. Uh, the other reasons ridership is very important uh, goes back to my point about cost control. Um, ridership also drives our fair revenue projections, which drives the net cost that we need to recover through a grant or other partners or other funds. If those calculations are not correct, um, that leaves a deficit in the budget that we would have to grapple with. Uh, so that leads us to tend to want to be conservative in our ridership estimates, um, but at the same time, the grant application is competitive, so we don't want to be too conservative. Yeah. Are, is there, at least from what you know now, are, are there any firms that do these kind of surveys or, or in some way that would establish a credible base to say this is our estimate? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. My second question um, involved success of, the, of this uh, uh, pilot project. If we are really successful, and I think certainly the potential, is there anybody who's been on 23 knows that there could be a huge demand for this. If there's 240 parking places, did I, did I remember We're going to start with 180. 180, okay. If, if it turns out to be very successful and, we, and there needs to be more places to put cars out on 23, uh, can that lot be expanded? Can there be locations for other lots? To, you, uh, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned about. earlier, we are uh, purchasing, we are in negotiation to purchase about a five acre uh, parcel. And the idea is to put it right next to the rail line. And uh, the, the phase one is to build 180 spaces just to see how that works out. If, if it turns out to be a successful project, then there's room to expand that, that, that lot to uh, take more. Do you know how much, how many spaces might be the potential? Oh, I, I think it will depend on how, you know, the, the demand for the ridership at that time, or demand for the use of that lot. But if it's really w wonderful demand, mm -hmm. how high could that go on that certain? Um, I, I, I would think we probably can expand a five-acre lot by maybe another hundred uh, mm -hmm. spaces, I would think, roughly. I would also add that the adjoining land is currently vacant. Right. Uh -huh. So we don't want to yes. get ahead of ourselves, but right. that level of expansion. Well, let's is hope possible. that'll be a problem. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> and of course, if there's funding, it all depends on that, right. number one. Larry? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, refer folks to the, um, the recent study of the North South Rail. Um, which had uh, several scenarios where ridership was identified and that might serve as a good starting place. Correct. Okay. Others? Rashawn? <coughs> <Sean? 
Yeah, just real quick. Uh, we, there are a lot of detailed questions that we've asked, um, but I, I do want to remind people, the board members, that I mean, this is essentially a pilot project, right? So a lot of the answers that we think we should have now, we might actually learn from the project itself. And I think as long as the authority knows what it wants to learn from this project and can measure you know, success based on what they've learned and what they were expecting, um, that's really the important basis upon which to run this project, I think. So I'm sure we'll get filled in on a lot of these details as the project goes, but I think because this is a pilot project, I, I think we should focus our conversation in that spirit. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think it, it is important to ask Matt how will they measure success, but I think also it'll be a question for ourselves to ask, you know, how are we expecting Matt to measure success or how do we want that to look? How do we want success to look? Because ultimately, um, in the space of judging him against our ENDS policies in terms of providing the appropriate services at the appropriate cost, et cetera, that's an interpretation um, that we're going to have to judge Matt on and his interpretation of it, and we're going to have to see if we agree with it. So I think it's important to ask him how he measures success, but we're going to have to also kind of have some internal dialogue about that. Any others? Uh, you probably probably said this, but the CMAC grant would cover the total cost of the full pilot, correct? We wouldn't have to renew it, in other words, I mean, at some point. The intent is to seek a multi-year CMAC grant that would cover uh, two, ideally three, but two may be all we can get. Um, and thank you for this slide. Uh, it would cover all of the operations costs of running the service. Um, so none of the capital, MDOT is carrying all right. of that water. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah. But if we, do we have to specifically say, we think this is gonna be a two year pilot, so we want $1.2 million, or do we, yes. are we gonna? Okay, so we're gonna have to decide that ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also about staff time, you said there, we, we have the capacity, but how much staff time do you think will be dedicated to this? And, and would it were, would it require more staff people to be brought on? Excellent question. I always love questions about do you have the organizational capacity? Um, uh, we do not believe additional staff would be required. Um, this will be in many respects very similar to contracts we already have. Uh, again, I re I'm referring to Air Ride. Um, so we have a basis upon which to um, not only develop that, but we already have personnel responsible for managing that contract and monitoring those operations. So we already incur those costs. The marginal costs of this do not seem excessive. Um, uh, procurement, this is just another procurement cost and we're quite geared up to handle those. Um, I think actually we're getting better uh, and more efficient <coughs> at handling those. Um, no, I think we have the organizational capacity uh, internally to do it. The, the one caveat I'll put on that is if we are successful and we need to start approaching local partners to help for permanent funding, if the pilot is successful and we want to make this a permanent addition, where is that going to come from? Uh, that may require a bit of thinking and time and energy uh, from staff, the board, uh, other local units of government. Uh, so that may uh, be a cost that we would incur a year after the project begins, I think it would need at least a year to know whether or not it's promising. But I think that would be largely managerial uh, executive time uh, for fundraising, for lack okay. of a better word. Yeah. Jillian? I just have a really quick final comment. Um, Matt said the magic word that had been in my head. Um, when we considered this proposal earlier, we, um, we asked ourselves why why does this compete favorably with a car? Why would you get out of your car and wait for a bus and to get on the bus and sit in traffic as opposed to sitting in your own vehicle in traffic? Um, and I think that there, you know, there are a couple answers to that, but, but Matt said the, the one that I really do think is part of the answer, and that is Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I do think that's actually a, a big part of the reason. I, I've spent a lot of time on that quarter, and I can tell you that the 3G is a little spotty. Um, but I, I think that the point I'm trying to make is, is about these passenger amenities in general. When we're looking at attracting um, choice riders, when you say, you know, 
comfy seats. It's a, it's a, you know, easy ride. You're not stressed out, etc. We have all of those things. The thing that our um, buses don't ri have right now is Wi-Fi. Um, and so, if this can also be a pilot to see how much that costs, what it requires us to operate, what kind of software we need, um, I, I, that's something that I would love to be able to, s to um, at some point, expand to our other buses. Thank you. Sue. Um, Jillian, I just would add that I think um, not having to hunt for a parking place once you get into Ann Arbor and as a community from a land use perspective, looking at the highest and best use of our center core area as a, as a area <coughs> not needing to be filled up with um, spaces for cars would be a wonderful thing. So this is sort of a toe in the water for that, I think. Agreed. Thank you. Others? Okay. Let me say thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you to the members of the board for having me and uh, giving us this much time to kind of share our, our thoughts and vision with you about the corridor. Well, thank you for thank coming. You so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. As you can tell, it's a topic of a lot of interest for our board so thank and you. our staff. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on then to item three, uh, policy monitoring and, and development. Um, annual plan of work, I don't think we have to adopt anything formal for this, uh, but I just kind of brought it up for discussion last time and wanted to know if anybody had any further comments about the annual plan of work and it's um, kind of the schedule that's in, it's kind of in our minutes, Appendix A, that's kind of the schedule monitoring, et cetera. Um, we also kind of laid it out on that big color-coded chart that we had. Um, if there were no other comments, we and if there's no other objections, we'll probably go with what we've got there. Um, but if anybody saw any glaring weaknesses to it, I thought I would just bring it back up again this this time. Mike, and just looking down the the monitoring uh, uh, informational report schedule, which is Appendix A in our board yep. uh, policy manual um, there was one thing that called ends focus of contracts uh, section 2.7 that says October um, I was wondering about that and I just wanted to mention that there's a couple of things that uh, are on for November one is quarterly financial statement the other is the capital improvement projects, and I know I know we're going to be seeing the uh, financial statements next month, but I d I'm not sure what's happening on capital improvement projects. Well, I th it's due in October, but assessed yeah. in November, and that's by the the service committee and the. Well, board. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line. Customer satisfaction, I guess, is one thing that's was being talked about. Oh, okay. At the service committee, so yeah, I was just on the wrong line. So, uh, what's what about the ends focus of c of contracts, which I think I am on the right line. Two point seven. Uh, if I might, I believe yeah. that's um, coming forward next month, as I read this. Um, well, it's due. It says due. Well, maybe I just don't understand the schedule. Uh, it says no, it's due in October. My um, understanding was is we see it in October. I'm looking, and then Sarah's trying to play charades with November. me. I'm wondering if she might use the microphone and okay. just uh, clarify before I get it wrong. Sure. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Um, uh, it's due the last day of that month, so we'll turn it in oh, okay. on October 31st or uh, earlier, um, partially to keep it uh, untangled from the current month. Okay. And I know, I believe she's submitted me something it's in my inbox uh, ticking so uh, I know we're working on it okay so I'll make a note in my book that that means the last day of the month not not the board yeah. okay any other comments about the annual plan of work Jillian I'm not sure this is the right place to bring it up um, but I, I guess it's, it's a little bit of a procedural question uh, I had some interesting comments from a, an ownership connection point of view, uh, where folks um, 
made a comment when I shared the um, Ypsilanti Transit Center study and survey. Um, the very first question when you click on that survey is, are you male or female? Um, and I had quite a few people, actually, more than one, several people say, uh, hold on, why, why isn't there another option? Um, and uh, you know, asking for demographic information up front is not a best practice. Um, so, and then this, this turned into a conversation then about um, how transgender people are treated uh, and specifically the fact that um, the fair deal card requires um, that people use their legal name uh, as opposed to the name that they use. So to me, this brought up a couple questions where I thought, okay, this is an important issue. Where does that fit into our uh, you know, governance issues? Is it, I, I kind of felt like it's covered under treatment of riders in that we say we don't want any form of discrimination and I think that's fairly clear and we haven't gotten to the interpretation of that yet. Um, so I'm wondering, does that get brought up under treatment of riders? Um, and, and in that case, I'm just sharing this as information for the staff to consider when we do get to treatment of riders. Um, or is that something that we potentially need to address further in a plan of work? My instinct is that is to um, just sort of share it and put it under treatment of riders. Um, well, I think if, if I think if we if we as a board think people are immediately right now being discriminated against, I think we have a, an obligation to address it now. I mean. Um, so I don't think I wouldn't want to wait sure. till January to do that. So if that's it's an issue we need to look into, let's not hesitate on it. Give me a second. So, uh, but procedurally, just so you know, I think you know, as a I, I I don't have a problem putting an issue like that under emergent business to okay. say, you know, I'm aware as a board member of possible discrimination and I need to bring this to the board's attention. Let's address that. And and so if that means we address some issues by the time we get to the report in January we can we can have it addressed I don't have a problem with that so Great. Um, if unless anybody sees it otherwise yeah. Matt. thank you um, I'd like to double down on that if I might uh, under policy 2.1 treatment of writers Mr. streams is absolutely correct um, I would go further to say the CEO is, um, uh, shall not use forms that elicit personal information for which there is no clear necessity. You've already written that to me. Thank you for bringing to my attention that we might not be on the right side of that policy. I will transmit that information to the appropriate staff. I also respect the idea of demographic data at the front end of a survey. It is a typical traditional thing that is normally done for post-processing. Um, but thank you for bringing it to my attention. That gives us something to ponder, uh, whether or not that is strictly necessary yes. for the purposes of the work. Is it, is it a business necessity in any capacity? That's, I guess, the question. Okay. And then the second issue about the fair deal card, um, I, I, maybe I could bring up during an emergent business since I brought it up. It seems like that would be something I just want to bring to folks' attention and see if we can um, have an answer for that. Um, as we move forward. Okay. Rashana? Yeah, just as a matter of. Okay. Just take this thing off. Yeah. Um, well, as a matter of, I guess, policy governance, we have kind of an example here, right? Um, where the CEO has determined that a staff action or, you know, was, was out of compliance. Is it, is it appropriate for us to, I guess, state for the record that as a board we think that the way that survey is written is not a reasonable interpretation of certain uh, executive limitation and then and not and say and or or do we have to be more specific than that or well I, there's a couple of layers to it one is um, again kind of the holistic approach to it we, we can't have just one board member saying Matt, I, I interpret this differently. I think we're out of compliance. You go change that, right? So, I mean, we don't want board member as well-meaning as it is to say, I found discrimination. You have to go change this. Um, we want a board approach, is, which is kind of why, you know, I'm, we're opening up for discussion here, which is appropriate. Um, but Jillian is right to raise it as a, hey, this is a potential discriminatory issue and a possible compliance issue that I'm aware of, and I have an obligation to bring it forward. Um, Matt has already, um, before we could vote on it, take it up and said, you know, da-da-da, charge, and he's going to go do it. 
So, I mean, we don't have that issue right here, but that's a good procedural point, which is, I mean, typically a board member would raise it, we would discuss it, and then if, if we as a board feel it's worthy of being acted on, we would say probably the second step would be, Matt, we think this is out of compliance. Would you go back and, and see, you know, give us your best estimate. Is it in compliance or not? Um, he's already kind of gotten four chess moves ahead of us and said, yeah, I think that's out of compliance. So, you know, he's going to make some, some changes there. But if, if Jillian raises something we all think or the majority of us thinks it's out of compliance or at least we want a check on that uh, because we think there is a discriminatory issue potentially, then, then we will as a board ask Matt to go do that as opposed to, you know, one but you know one board member doing it. So I think that's kind of procedurally how it would go. Uh, we just skipped up the steps two through five in the middle in this case. Does that answer your question? You have more? Yeah, I'm just wondering. Okay, so because it, the result we we wanted was achieved, which is that Matt said that he was going to take action to be in compliance, then it's as if we we didn't need to vote on it. And so we don't, we shouldn't worry about it. I yeah, mean, I mean, until, I think until we find uh, a non-compliance again. Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, it's it's his. You know, we've given him the policy; he's got to interpret it and, and be in compliance with it. So if he's kind of already done the work that you know he's already taken the <laughs> debate out of our hands, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, typically, if it was something much less obvious, we would probably say you know uh, you know to bring up our our all. You know, one of our favorites, the reserve policy, if we brought that up and said, I think it's a compliance, I think it's not, and then we, we'd have to have some discussion and then say, Matt, um, what do you think of it? He'd have to come back to us with a brief um, because we think there's an immediate impact to it. Now, that's not to say with every issue we would ask him to do that if it's not in part of the monitoring schedule. I mean, if we see a um, – there's a difference between seeing, in, like I'd say in this case, a rider who was treated – in a discriminatory or unfair way during a transaction on the bus or at one of our transit centers, let's say. Um, and, you know, we as a board wanted to get into that. Um, maybe it would be a little more not as cut and dry as, as something like this where we'd say, yeah, we really don't see a need for that. Um, but that would be a different issue that we just want to bring to Matt's attention. Hey, we saw mistreatment of a rider. The policy is all clear. We've agreed on what mistreatment of riders means, and, and Matt would say, "Well, that's an operational issue. I'll go deal with that." This is a policy issue that requires interpretation of the policy. I, all right, you know, is this discriminatory? Should this even be this way? Is this what we meant to say? I don't. I'm not sure it is. Um, you know, Jillian had questions about that. She brought that to our attention. Matt jumped on it and kind of said, "Yeah, I think that's out of compliance." But she could have easily said, you know, hey, uh, this is an issue, let's discuss it. And we could have had some roundtable discussion about what does the policy mean? Do we really need that? Should we have more than just male or female choices? Um, is that what we were meant to do? Why do we even have that question there? I mean, who cares if, the, you know, it's a male or females are running the bus? What is that for? What's the business necessity? I don't know. Um, we, we could have had all that discussion and then said, yeah, we're fine with it. And Matt, you know, don't, no need to follow up on that. We, I mean, that could have happened, although it didn't in this case. But I think procedurally, yeah, we want some, if not consensus, at least majority board action to say, yeah, Matt, go go take some action with that, I would think. Jack. Yeah, I just would want us to take care that I think from time to time we will encounter moments where we look and say, oh, look, not everything is completely in line with the way we expected it to be. I don't know that every one of those circumstances requires a vote that we, you know, further clarify a general principle when when the CEO is saying, this is great in line with my interpretation, I'm going to go back and, and address it so that so that we don't have to. I think that the idea is when, when there is a schism in the group or when we feel like m maybe there's been a consistent set of practices or a very obvious practice that the CEO is, is had no way to interpret from our policy. I think that's an ideal opportunity to have the kind of engagement yeah. um, that uh, Prashanth and, uh, and and Jillian were sort of leaning towards. Um, uh, anyway, I just I, I, I think the whole idea behind policy governance is that w there are some things we can just all nod our heads and say, okay, yes, we've, we've, we've got to address that. Yeah. Which is, again, the difference between bringing up a, a, a 
non-compliance issue with an established policy that's versus kind of like a factual issue like hey it, we think this is mistreatment you know and that's something Matt can handle with the staff versus this is an interpretive policy issue that may go one way or the other and that's kind of the discussion that we need to have here oh go ahead Jillian at risk of um, getting too far into the weeds or into gender politics um, I I actually do think there's a good reason to ask if respondents are male or female when it comes to the YTC survey, um, because another question that is addressed in that survey is, do you feel safe at the YTC? Uh, and if you find a significant difference between whether women and whether men feel safe, that's definitely something to look at. Um, so the, the question I was actually uh, hoping to pose is, could we add another uh, prefer not to answer um, option on that? Um, and, and just in general, especially when it comes to demographic questions, um, even just a prefer not to answer uh, as an option, I think uh, helps uh, helps folks feel like there's a there's an out and uh, that they don't need to specifically classify themselves in a particular way in order to take the survey. So, just something to think about as we as we move forward. And uh, oh, I mean, if you want even further, do you have to answer that question to answer the rest of the survey? Sure, but I think giving yeah. people a, a clear out is is helpful. Yeah. Any others? Matt? Thank you, if I might. Um, to Prashant's question, if you turn over the front page of your agenda, uh, you have a very thoughtfully supplied cheat sheet, thank you, Sarah, um, that uh, towards the bottom half deals with how do we talk about emergent topics. And this is uh, copied from your policy manual. I think, Prashant, it speaks to the question of um, how do we raise an issue? We're not sure whose role it is to grapple with that. Um, what it does, this uh, four-step process, uh, it's just sort of give you a way to structure your thinking. I think it's very much, Eric, what you just said uh, in many ways. Um, and as you were said, I, I sort of looked at the last one. Is there already a board policy that covers this issue? And I flipped between your end statements, which have some uh, comments respecting discriminatory questions and the treatment of uh, writers, um, I did not see anything in there regarding gender at all. So that might be an area uh, for the board to explore uh, if the CEO's interpretation is not adequate or even if it is and you feel strongly that it needs to be uh, 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 codified in the policy, this four-step process kind of leads you in that direction. Thanks. All right. Any others? Okay. We'll move on then to item 3B, uh, policy monitoring and committee reports. Um, not much else from the governance committee that we didn't already discuss at the last meeting. Um, again, we do have the board retreat coming up. We are working on an agenda that will be uh, potentially circulating. Um, sometime in the next couple of weeks we have another governance committee meeting coming up next week and I hope after that we can circulate a draft agenda uh, we are working on uh, doing an RFP for a uh, facilitator type mediator um, somebody who can um, you know help us drive some outcomes and um, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, kind of help well help make sure we don't go off the rails with with um, getting too far afield of, of policy governance in general. But I think some of the main topics we want to cover are uh, obviously ends will be a big part of it. Uh, ownership linkage will be a big part of it. Um, uh, some uh, uh, identification of some wins that we've done. I think we want to recognize some things, that some good things we've done in the agency over the last um, uh, 12 months. Um, and you know, one of the big things that, that will hopefully come out of the uh, board retreat is to at least start to at least not start make a lot of progress on any revisions we want to do to the ends so that we can by March let's say hand those off to Matt and the staff so they can start building a budget process around how they will achieve those ends uh, and so this is an important discussion because there'll be money uh, tied you know tied to that uh, but I think you know, we'll, we're working on a facilitator and we'll kind of bring some names forward and, and hopefully land one soon. Um, 
I think that's about it on governance committee. Any questions? Finance committee, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. It, uh, last week's finance committee, we had uh, two nice meaty topics, which I think uh, we had some very uh, worthwhile discussions on. Um, the first one had to do with the policy manual and the executive limitation section, which is uh, section two. You may recall that there's a 2.6 in there, and it just says uh, to be added. And that happens, that section is investments. So we had, we had uh, a, a good discussion on investments. Just as far as background goes, um, you know, we're talking really about cash and investments. Um, we, in, in the last year, I think the ride has uh, varied between $8 million and $17 million. So we're talking about some substantial dollars here. Um, also want to point out, because there can be some confusion, the cash and investment number is not the same as our reserves that we talk about all the time. Um, the reserves are basically uncommitted reserves that would be available to, for purposes that we didn't anticipate. A, a lot of our total cash and investments are really committed to, to pay for certain things, like buses, for example. So there, there is a significant difference there, and cash and investments is a bigger number than our reserves. Um, in, in discussing this topic of investments, we were provided what was very helpful, first of all, what the state law as, is regarding that for an agency such as ours. Um, we looked at what the previous investment policy was for the ride, happened to be adopted in 2005. I'm not sure it's gotten a whole lot of uh, observation <laughs> since 2005, uh, certainly not in my time on the board. Um, and taking a look at that, it had, it had a whole lot of options that I don't think anybody had any intention of using, and I'm pretty confident haven't been used in the last 12 years since the policy was adopted. I think things like investing in commercial paper, repurchase agreements, and, and other things that I think are probably not what we want to consider in, in, in our current environment anyway. Um, we also uh, looked at what the policy was uh, for the city of Ann Arbor, which of course they have piles of money and and they have to have <laughs> a, a very, they have, in, in, in longer term investments, which we don't have and we the need for. So, but it was still enlightening to look at that. Uh, we had some really nice discussions regarding different options that we thought we might want to consider. We even talked about, you know, how would this, does this even fit within policy governance, for example? Uh, might it be just adequate? I mean, we already have something in there about uh, obeying the law, about not taking excessive risk. So maybe we didn't even need a, uh, a separate policy regarding investments. Maybe that was adequately covered already. We had a lot of those kind of discussions, but I think in the end, we had a consensus that we do want to have a brief policy in there that we, I think, at least want to start out with one that's quite conservative and once we have that policy and as we go forward, we might want to enlarge it to allow additional things to be done that maybe wouldn't be in the real conservative policy. So anyway, we're going to look at it again next month. Um, I believe the staff is going to have a, a suggested <coughs> uh, brief policy for us to look at. We'll discuss it and I hope uh, we'll be able to arrive at some decision at our meeting next month. The second topic that we had a nice discussion about is one that we had discussed a month earlier too, and that's quarterly financial reporting. I, I'm sure everybody knows that we used to have monthly financial reporting and that the policy manual, uh, the policy we just 
decided on uh, is quarterly. I think we also had discussed at various times in the board and, and, and numerous times at the committee is it, we thought that it would be worthwhile to have significant revisions to the way that the financials are presented to the committee and to the board. Uh, we had in, in past meetings, we had some nice discussions about what might be a good way to do it. Uh, John, uh, at the August meeting, uh, put forth a, his first reaction to that and what it might look at. It was a very good start. We had some very good back and forth discussions about that. And John presented us with another example of how it might be uh, um, when we saw it last week, and uh, which we liked a lot, had a few thoughts that it might be fine tuned, and John will be coming back next month with the actual quarterly report because November is the date that the uh, fourth quarter report is due to the board. And so I, I'm very confident that uh, when we meet next week, or I mean next month at the committee and then at, at the board that we'll be, see uh, something that I hope everybody uh, will think is a very positive thing. It's quite a, it's not as detailed, it's more graphical, uh, and I, I hope people will find it more useful. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Any questions on the Finance Committee report? Comments? Right. We'll move on to item 3B3, which is the Service Committee report. I think Jillian's going to do that. Thank you. Uh, I chaired the Service Committee since uh, Roger was not able to be there. Uh, we had just a couple items of discussion. Um, during our communications, we did uh, have a brief discussion about the Ann Arbor Station environmental assessment process, um, which primarily consisted of uh, encouraging staff to um, submit comments uh, on the project and on the um, viability of serving that area with transit. Um, uh, the bulk of our discussion was around the policy monitoring and development report, which <coughs> you will see in your packet. Um, the version that you're seeing has been uh, changed somewhat since, the, since what we saw, um, and we had quite a few um, substantive comments on how to um, improve that report. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that we were looking at the interpretation and the compliance statement at the same time. Um, so sort of hopping back and forth between both of those since it was the first time we've been through it. Um, and the other difficulty for staff being that external relations is kind of a hard thing to come up with very concise and clean metrics. Um, how do you measure the success of your external relations? Um, so we had a pretty robust discussion about that. Um, specifically, we um, had a few suggestions on how this monitoring report in the future could just include links to existing information. For example, adopt a stop partners, um, uh, folks, uh, organizations that receive um, grants, uh, tokens uh, through our grant program, um, that kind of thing, that we could demonstrate our, um, some of our support, community support that way, uh, which you will see as have been added to the project. Um, a second suggestion, uh, specifically around 210.2, uh, was to um, be fairly specific. It, it outlines a number of goals in terms of last mile um, connections and multimodal, um, multimodal connections that support our service. Uh, and so we, we um, suggested a, uh, an idea of um, external relations and in, in how have our external partners, how have we worked with external partners to help us meet these goals that are articulated in the policy. Um, so that's kind of an area for future development. Um, finally, we uh, did have some discussions around the um, communication with uh, government officials specifically. Um, there were some questions raised about the Ypsilanti Township um, services and the express ride, uh, and we felt that there were some areas there where um, external partner communications could have been a lot better. Uh, and so as a result um, of all of that, uh, the committee recommends that we um, that the ride is currently not in compliance with this particular set of um, uh, this particular policy, um, but that we saw a, a good um, good progress toward compliance in this report, 
um, that this report itself had a um, re really good start in terms of its um, interpretation of the policy and had some good steps to um, include those, both the measurements of compliance and then raising the actual standard of compliance for um, next time around. So we've made a recommendation um, to the board that we would adopt the, um, that we would accept the compliance report with, um, with the note that, that we don't feel it is compli in compliance, but we, um, you know, we do think it's an important report. We don't have to be 100% the very first year, and that's okay. Um, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity to um, go through that. And that concludes my report. All right, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to item 3B4, which is a monitoring report on the external relations. And I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Julian is a tough act to follow. Uh, uh, I am pleased to submit to the board's consideration our second monitoring report. Um, uh, we did have a very constructive and frank conversation with the service committee. We really appreciate their feedback um, to help us make it better. We also appreciate their patience and understanding that we're all learning into it. Um, uh, uh, we're quite proud of some of the interpretations in here. Uh, we don't believe that they're 100% complete, but we appreciate the, the committee's perspective that they show um, uh, good movement in the correct direction. Uh, we also acknowledge that the information and the evidence that's been supplied is not complete yet. Um, uh, it is an interesting thing about how would we demonstrate evidence to you um, that our relationships externally are of a high enough quality to garner support for the agency is an interesting sort of methodological puzzle, and we're still uh, working on that. And we appreciate uh, appreciate the patience. Um, by and large, I do think, uh, anecdotally, uh, we're doing well in many of these areas, notwithstanding a couple of uh, boo boos that we have moved to correct uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so, with that, uh, as as uh, stated, I. Would hope you would vote to accept the report um, as uh, not in compliant, but of uh, showing good effort in the right direction. I think we characterized it as uh, pretty good for now, uh, as my notes uh, from the uh, from the committee. Uh, would somebody like to move the pretty good for now motion? All right, Jillian, second by Jack. All those in favor of accepting the report, raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you, that passes. Uh, we'll move in on to item 3C, which is other board reports and ownership linkages, linkages. And C1 is a report out from our local advisory council. I think Cheryl's still here. Is it on now? Okay, I'm on. Hello. Hello. Um, I was not able to be at the LAC because I was on vacation, but I had a significant conversation with the leadership that were there in my stead, and we were in the middle of changing horses because um, Elizabeth, uh, the second co-chair had resigned and um, people had been nominated and they chose um, Kathleen Mozak betts to be the second chair and Elizabeth confidently and gladly handed the reins over to her mid-meeting <laughs> and uh, she handled it very well to um, by all reports. So, um, <coughs> I uh, contacted Kathleen and congratulated her and thanked her. She is a relatively new person to um, participating on the LAC, but she has proved to be a very observant and um, positive, uh, constructive um, person to give feedback to the authority. So I'm, I'm very happy with her 
uh, accepting and successfully gaining the seat. Okay, uh, we've received two uh, applications um, to, to be on the LAC, so those will be considered at our next meeting and then brought to the board for your approval to be on the LAC. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the board um, reconsidering um, the LAC's role going forward. Um, the LAC for the AAATA is a very um, interesting animal. No other authority in the state of Michigan has an LAC with the depth of experience or engagement of our LAC. So it's, it's worth considering. Um, when I looked at um, our newest second chair being someone who hasn't been with us very long and said, oh my goodness, I've been advising here for the better part of 20 years. So has Clark Charnetsky, who also attends SIMCOG and <laughs> um, various organizations in the community that covers transit. Um, Jody Slowens, you know, who has ties with CIL and other disability organizations, and Rebecca Burke. We have all served for more than a decade. You probably have 80 years of depth of experience on your LAC. And that's not part of the minutes, but just an observation I wanted to share with you. So the charge and the authority for the LAC to exist comes from you. And I don't know if it comes within the governance committee or who that's with, but you know, feel, please feel free. Um, well, now that, you, now that you raise that, Cheryl, I, I will um, probably want to get some time on the next calendar to okay. come to the next LAC meeting myself. Great. To talk to the LAC about how they can, you know, a big part of the policy governance, and I know you're aware of this because you're, you're familiar yeah. with it, yeah. uh, is ownership linkage. Yes. And, and I see the LAC as being one of the, if not the primary, um, at least formalized body that can help us with ownership linkage. And yes. I would like to utilize um, LAC to do that for us and, and help us with that. So um, there's probably gonna, there's gonna be some suggestions from me in terms of how we can help kind of reformat and what kind of the work and maybe uh, reconfigure some of the LAC's work to help us with that specifically because I wanna start um, driving uh, more focused attention on um, the loop between what we ask Matt and the staff to do mm -hmm. and what we're getting from our owners in terms of ownership linkage mm -hmm. uh, that we can ask, you know, then feedback to Matt. There's gotta be a circle about that. And I see the LAC is a, you know, an example right there that we can use that we're not probably utilizing as much as we should. Uh, so I I'm, I'm gonna get some time on yeah. our calendar to, to talk about that or, I, or I LAC's think we've calendar. Been yeah, most useful in like almost immediate feedback to how the service operates sure. um, monthly, but um, and and I and instead of just kind of like here's you know this trip didn't work so well or that right. trip didn't work so well, I guess I'm more interested in is this the kind of overall service that you're that you would envision or is you know what yeah. are your thoughts about you know changing service what are your thoughts about you know. Um, you know, here's our policy on treatment of riders. I mean, is this is this what you're experiencing when you're out there? And then kind of getting that feedback loop going is important to us. So it'll be yeah. um, probably, I, I guess, overall what I'm thinking, it'll be less trip by trip focused uh, right. and more policy driven discussion. But you've uh, you've got such you. a depth of experience there that yeah. we've participated on. in looking at contracts, we've participated in um, 
just so many things yeah. with the authority that. So I want to take advantage of that eight yeah. decades of experience <laughs> and, and help us inform our policy making role yeah. here and our monitoring role, quite frankly. So um, um, probably next month. Right. Thank you. Anything else I needed? That that was the most important part of um, Clark, as usual, brought us the information from SimCog and and Smart, so that your your LAC go really does go beyond what happened with my ride in the last month. That your LAC is getting a wider view of transit throughout southeastern Michigan, yep. and over a long period of time. <laughs> Good. Take care. Thank you. Uh, item three. Sorry, Jack. Sorry. Sorry. I just want to. I want to add something because I think it's imp just important to highlight this. I. I was at the meeting and I, I just. Oh yeah. Sure. No. 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 No problem. Um, uh, there. First of all, in <laughs> um, public comment time is very different at the LAC than it is here. Um, it really is public engagement time and there's a lot of discussion that takes place and so oftentimes we can spend half the meeting on public comment time um, and there was a really interesting discussion that took place about the trapeze software and our our transition um, there and the kinds of problems that that um, riders were encountering it was a very a very uh, productive discussion um, it, it's exactly what we should expect to have happening at the LAC where constituents and people have been talking with owners um, about the services that they that they that we are providing for them and that they are experiencing raised concerns and it wasn't just this was my ride and it was bad they 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 commented on the systemic elements on this sort of process elements and um, it, it was great because we had our our provider in the room we had staff in the room we had a board member on the phone we had uh, uh, riders in the room. It was it was great. Uh, just a, a great discussion, and uh, I think it's exactly the kinds of interaction we're hoping to see for, from LAC. And I, I just really wanted to underscore that point. Thank you. Thank you. No, I saw that the um, it was mentioned in here about the trapeze software, so I'm glad you elaborated on that. That's good. Uh, item three C two, the uh, Watts report. Mr. Krieg, do you have one? Yes. Thank you. Um, Watts met yesterday, and a uh, uh, number of um, announcements, uh, one of which uh, is just to make sure the staff is aware that the uh, um, call for projects in the long range plan is due in March of 2018. Um, the policy committee approved the guidelines for use of um, SDP funds that had been drafted by the technical committee um, and which I circulated to the board for comment. I did not receive any comments. Um, did you all receive it? Okay, good. All right. So that is uh, that has passed and the, the general idea for those who may be uh, uh, listening in is that um, local funds um, are not usually used on state trunk lines. Those are state um, approved or state um, managed roads. So Washtenaw Avenue, for example, uh, was, uh, uh, we had planned to create a mid-block crossing to make it easier for our riders to reach the county um, center on Hogback Road. And uh, that was postponed um, due to a question of whether that was an appropriate uh, policy. And uh, now we have a, uh, a policy guidance that will at least uh, give us the uh, some very specific uh, ways to approve that. Um, another item that was approved was the, uh, the equity goals, which I believe I brought to this board to consider a number of months ago. And 
and uh, so they are incorporated in the long range transportation plan. Uh, the, the best summary of that is uh, that a person's zip code should not determine their um, success in life. The um, uh, transportation improvement plan was impr uh, amendments to that uh, were approved, including our uh, submission for um, a grant to uh, do alternative uh, fuel vehicle study uh, or acquisition, and I'm not quite sure exactly what that was, possibly due to uh, my absence, but I would uh, uh, hope that we can talk about that a little bit more. And finally, uh, a couple of announcements, one of which was that the uh, uh, Downtown Development Authority here um, announced that they are now uh, once again studying feasibility of a downtown connector, such as our, what we used to run as the link. And uh, there were for uh, transportation geeks, including uh, our own staff, there will be an MDOT traffic summit um, on November 7th from 9 to noon. Uh, and uh, presumably uh, you have that information, but I just want to make sure that you get it. Okay, so that concludes my report. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions on the Watts report? Item 3C3 then, the Ann Arbor Transportation Commission report. Prashant. Yes, the meeting uh, was last night as well. Um, there were a couple important agenda items uh, and a couple informational items about uh, progress on uh, pedestrian safety, um, but I'll focus my uh, summary on a couple main items. One was the commission voted on a set of recommendations to, to the city um, regarding the capital improvement plan. And uh, I won't read through them all, but there is a, a couple important ones here. Uh, and, th and these have been under some iteration for some time over the last couple of meetings and have been refined through committee work as well as um, consultation with city staff. Um, one is to, uh, council should direct that all CIP road improvement and reconstruction projects uh, include efforts to calm traffic and lower speed, consistent with Vision Zero. Um, and then there was, um, city should explore opportunities to identify CIP projects related to safe routes to school. Uh, city should add a bicycle network program to the CIP similar to the sidewalk gap program, so uh, kind of identifying uh, gaps in the bicycle network. Um, uh, proposed, uh, the proposed bicycle boulevard, boulevard for Washington, Washington Street should be considered for inclusion during the next full CIP cycle. And um, there were a couple other suggestions as well that are there for the record. Um, the other item which constituted maybe the majority of the meeting was a uh, presentation by Transportation Programs Manager uh, at, at the city, who um, is in the boardroom but shall remain nameless right now. Uh, but uh, he gave a, a brief summary about the train station environmental assessment. Um, and uh, we had a pretty good discussion that followed. Um, uh, we had questions about, uh, I guess, basically uh, information about the EA that, that um, said Programs Manager, sorry. Eli gave, gave answers to. Um, at the heart of it, or, or after the discussion, uh, there was a resolution for discussion and, and a vote for um, the commission to vote on. And I'll read the resolved clauses because <coughs> I think I want to go into this uh, in a little more detail. Um, the commission recognizes the need for an improved intermodal station in the community. The commission supports integration of active transportation systems, including bicycling and walking elements, including linkages with the B2B trail as a fundamental component of meeting park and intercity rail passenger needs. And the commission supports council taking whatever actions are required or appropriate under federal law to finalize the selection of the site for the station through the current EA process, including public engagement. 
So this resolution did indeed pass uh, after some engaging discussion and after some commissioners in, um, indicated that uh, they were torn about how to vote, ab vote for it. Um, several of them um, had reservations about the selection itself, the site selection, but thought it was important to move forward. Uh, the resolution itself is ostensibly site agnostic. Um, so the resolution passed, but I did vote no on it, and I want to take a moment to explain why I voted no on it. Um, as some of you know, I, I do think that Fuller is not the optimal site out of the ones that were um, being evaluated. But it's not really, that's not really at the core of why I uh, voted no. It's about the third resolved clause. I'm not sure what's out of order exactly. I mean, how he, how he explains his vote as a representative of the board of directors as we appointed him to sit on the Transportation Commission and, and his explanation of his vote, I'm not sure that's out of order. How's that out of order? This is on liaison reports and linkages. Yes. An individual's internal feelings about an action. Uh, the report is that the Commission voted affirmatively, and there were negative votes. Yes. An individual's um, feelings might be appropriate under public comment, but not under commission linkages. If you deem it to be appropriate. Well, I mean, I, if he had voted yes, and he wanted to explain why he voted yes or did support it, I don't think we'd stop him for that. Um, I don't see that this is out of order, so I'll allow it. Um, but your objections noted for the record. Yeah, and, and, and most of my comments are things that I've said at the meeting, and, I, and that's there for the record. And I, because this board appointed me to this commission, I feel like I want to explain this particular vote a little more. Um, there was no, I mean, there was disagreement, nece but there was nece not necessarily, no nothing was, um, I guess, you know, it, it was a collegial discussion. Um, uh, so what I had indicated in the meeting was that uh, the EA process, uh, I felt, as I uh, indicated in the meeting, was uh, had metrics that were very auto-centric, uh, automobile-centric. Um, the federal, the, this, after reading the EA, I was, um, th there's a lot of analysis and metrics based on level of service or traffic delay uh, without a um, similar sophisticated analysis on, on the impacts on tra transit riders and uh, pedestrians and, and people who use other forms of transportation. Uh, the end result, of course, was a uh, was the alternatives we've all seen. It's a lot of uh, parking spots that, uh, that, that they're proposing that are a lot, it's a lot more than what's there right now. And, you know, we've heard earlier today about parking, um, consuming the core of our city and, um, in general, as my, as my comments in the meeting were summarized, um, this followed a federal process that I, and, and, and I understand why the city's following this process, but um, it may not be in line with um, the vision that, the, that I think the Transportation Commission and, and the city might have for the future of our city as it relates to walkability, transit, and the urban form. That said, um, the resolution did indeed pass. I just feel like I needed to explain why I voted uh, no. I'm happy to answer questions about the um, report. Um, what What are the next steps now that has passed? Uh, so the next steps, I guess Eli would be a better person to ask uh, for about the process generally. But I think as far as uh, our recommendation was to support the council taking whatever actions are required or appropriate under federal law to finalize a section of the site for the station through the current EA process, including public engagement. Okay. Um, the com public comments are due by November 2nd to Eli, um, after which there's a timeline for responding to them, and I would feel probably more comfortable for, for Eli to talk about details about that, but that's, that's how I understand that. Okay. Uh, Eli, do you want to follow up with that or care to? What with the next step? Yeah, we, the city 
uh, maintain an open public record uh, for those who are watching at home uh, through uh, 5 p.m. on November 2nd. Uh, the comments in written form can be provided to me, email at ecooper at a2gov.org, uh, or mail to me at my city hall address, 301 East Huron Street. Um, once the public record is closed, all comments will be reviewed, uh, and a report will be provided to uh, the Federal Railroad Administration. They're the agency of record on this EA report. Uh, that will uh, result in a determination as to whether the report is suitable for uh, production of a draft finding of no significant impact, which is the end result of an EA process. Uh, once that draft FONSI would be produced, it would be released by the FRA for a subsequent 30-day process before they could take formal legal action and accept that. One of the intermediate steps along the way is that uh, given the preferred alternative, Site 3A, uh, the Fuller Road location, um, was um, went into the draft EA process as a preferred alternative, and the parks, the city's Parks Advisory Commission, who met on Tuesday, uh, also reviewed the EA and made a recommendation to City Council that they agree with the EA's finding that the use of the existing surface parking lot in Fuller Park uh, to accommodate a future intermodal facility uh, meets the federal definition for a de minimis impact, and they recommended that on to council. Uh, pending uh, review of the public comments on November 2nd, uh, if there are no substantial changes, uh, an action will be brought before city council to act on forwarding a letter to the Federal Railroad Administration as the owner of the park. Uh, there's a requirement as part of the uh, Section 4F uh, review. And once that letter is submitted, that would be, uh, that combined with the findings of the public review process would give the FRA the material it needs in order to produce the FONSI. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Question, Larry? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to comment on the issue of um, representatives from this board to other bodies explaining uh, their actions. Um, I think uh, Mr. Guru Raja was uh, very uh, responsible in explaining uh, his reasons for either supporting or not supporting a potentially controversial issue. Um, and uh, so I would uh, encourage future reports on such controversial issues to be uh, made to the board. Well, I mean, it helps us understand if he's um, not representing the board's interest, then we understand why and we can, we can speak to him about that as well. So it gives the chance, the board a chance to address that when he, when he does explain himself uh, and others. Sue? Um, I actually have some other thoughts about that, and I wonder if that would be, if, if this particular topic is actually better to discuss under topics for the next meeting. Um, just not sure back to we can, but if you have the order of, of the agenda, if this is the topic we should be covering under this item. If it is, I'll give my comments now, but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we'll. I mean, that's a good question because I'm not sure we have a, uh, a policy for it, you know, exactly. So um, if you've got some thoughts on it, as long as we're discussing it, well, if you've got some immediate thoughts, let's talk well, about it. But well, I, I, I guess I, um, I think it's something we need to have a conversation about because if the uh, ride is making public um, – votes uh, or there's a perception that any one of us is representing the ride on a committee, a board, um, any other outside um, activities, uh, I think it's important that we have an understanding of how does the board provide our representative input for them to bring from the board to 
you know, a committee. And, and that would allow then us to have had a conversation in advance so that a board member could be clear that they are representing the board with whatever their um, statements are. So I think, it's, I think it's important that we actually talk about it. But it doesn't uh, it have to be right now. I'm no, just no. saying I think it's a good time. No, it is important, and and it's, I mean, it's not new. I mean, we've had representatives of this board on other committees, and, and you know, I think <laughs> when, when the RTA was coming to a vote, I think half of our board was on some committee or the other having to do with the RTA, whether it was, you know, CAC or some other, um, um, you know, offshoot of, of the RTA uh, board. So, I mean, this is something that's not new, and it's not going to go away either. So. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point. How do we know that the board member sitting on the committee is representing the board's interests um, and not wait till after the fact? You know, we, they make sure you have those those views ahead of time. That's um, important dialogue. So um, we'll, we'll try to find a place to fit it in somewhere. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Sue and Larry, for your input on that. Uh, there didn't seem like it didn't seem like a yes or a no would be contradicting existing board an existing board decision. Uh, a yes or no vote on this commission vote would be contradicting a, a standing policy by the board. Sorry, did I? No, no go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Um, well, I, and I know that I suspect that someone else who might have been appointed this position might have voted a different way, and that's why I felt like it was um, I needed to explain it. But also, um, even, though, even though someone might have voted a different way on this particular issue, I do feel like in the long term, the issues that I t brought up regarding the EA's emphasis on automotive metrics might not be in our best interest as a transit agency, as we run transit agency in support of the community over the long term. There might be certain benefits to um, the way uh, this particular preferred alternative shook out in the minds of some people in this room, that's fine. Um, but my comments stand for themselves as they relate to the long-term interest of transit in this community. Thank you. Jack. Just a very quick comment. Uh, this, this board appointed someone to, um, to the commission, but I don't think it, it's possible for the person we appointed to represent this board's view without any vote. There is no view of this board without a vote. And so I just, I think there is a difference between being a representative and being an appointee and I, I just, I think, I'm not saying whether or not we should be hearing about, uh, you know, the reasons that someone voted in a particular way, but I think that distinction is a really critical one as, as we go forward to think about this. No, it's a distinction. I mean, the, the board doesn't speak until we vote on something, right? So, I mean, and, and anything that would come out of this process that, you know, for whatever reason we would have to vote on, you know, we would speak and then Prashant would be one of ten people on the board who would vote. Um, but the extent of it is, you know, he is sitting there as a representative of this board, right? And so when people hear Prashant vote, speak, they may attribute to him the views of the board. So it is important, I think, to Sue's point of him getting the, the input of the board, you know, how do we know that he is fully informed about what the board thinks? So to the extent he's a the board of directors member sitting on that commission, people may hear him speak and attribute whatever he says to the full voice of the board. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think it can't be that way. It, it just, I don't, I don't think, I understand that people might do that, but. Well, I'm not saying he is doing that. Yeah, I'm he, saying people right, may attribute that right, to Right, they him. may, but I think that's why it's so critical for us to acknowledge that, that Prashanth does not represent the board there. He is our appointee. We had the opportunity to appoint someone, and I think it's a really critical difference for us in that, that those are the kinds of ways we should talk about it. Yeah, and I'm just saying the general public may not make that distinction. Yeah, thank you. Any others on this? Prashant? And just a matter of the, of the meeting and the resolution itself, this was brought to us relatively in a short amount of time before the meeting, which was, oh, I don't know, maybe a week ago we saw this resolution. So there's no way for the board, this sure. board to deliberate and come to a decision and say that we want our representative to vote a certain way. And I might also, I, I guess suggest that we're all poli political appointments as well. So, I mean, we can't be asked to vote in a certain way 
we're, in a, we're appointed into this board and we can't just ask what our political appointer would want before we make a vote on something. So I think the same principle should apply. I, I know this was a sensitive issue. That's why I felt like it was appropriate for me to explain it in further detail. And Matt just brought up, we do have a policy on this, which is 3.39. When serving on other boards, members remain accountable to the AAATA board for their actions and statements regarding transit-related issues. So he's, he does have a kind of a duty to explain to us what he's, what he's thinking and why he's thinking it, and to the extent that he's there appointed by our board, whether he's a representative or not of the board, he's got an obligation to, to come back and um, be accountable to us. So uh, we, do have a, we do have some link to that. We've turned a bunch of policy wonks now. This is great. Others? OK. Uh, we'll move on then to item four. And we move 4A up to 2B. So we'll move on then to the new 4A, which is the CEO report. Matt? Thank you. Um, the uh, written report is in your packet. Um, I wanted to add a couple of emergent things uh, that have happened since the packet went out. Uh, yesterday, I was able to have a conversation with one of our county representatives to the Regional Transit Authority, so I have an update there that I can share um, salient points. Um, as has been, I think, uh, reported in the press, was confirmed that really the decision action has moved to the political level, uh, the big four. Uh, being the, the, chair, uh, the chairmen of Oakland and Macomb County, Wayne County, um, the mayor of the city of Detroit, uh, are, are really steering the boat as to what happens next. Uh, Andy Labar, as the chair of the Washtenaw County Commission, is also uh, as part of those conversations. Um, the issue is centering around the content of the plan, the timing for another millage, uh, and uh, implicitly a mill rate. Uh, there does seem to be growing, uh, I don't want to say, beginnings of consensus that shrinking the footprint of the RTA uh, to remove rural areas uh, might be uh, a viable option to go forward, uh, simply not taxing or attempting to serve areas that are difficult to serve with public transit. Um, a lot of the uh, failure of the last vote is, is somewhat attributed to, to populations there who felt like they weren't uh, gaining much uh, from the RTA proposal. Uh, if that is uh, something that uh, political leadership decide to pursue, it will require a change of the RTA's enabling legislation at the state level in Lansing. Uh, guessing a timeline or implications or outcome of that is dangerous. I won't attempt to do it. Uh, but it does raise a question about the timing of the election. Uh, Ms. Gerber did share with me that they felt like if they didn't know what direction they were heading in by the end of this coming November, that would be one year away from when they would need to be running a millage if they were to do it in November of 2018. Uh, and so I think maybe psychologically, Nove this coming November represents a go-no-go no go decision point possibly for some people, uh, being one year out from when an election would need to happen. Can you? Uh, make the legislative changes, make any needed changes to a plan, and launch a, uh, a new campaign in 365 days, I think is an important part. Um, shrinking the footprint of the, of the authority um, also raises a question about the content of the plan. We understand that the political leadership are revisiting the content of the plan. We asked, uh, if the footprint shrinks, does the mill rate go up? Uh, the answer was inconclusive. Um, I would suggest that it's possible the content of the plan may be reopened. Uh, what exactly is in there and what the mill rate that comes out of it is, I, I do not know that the previous plan can be, uh, I think it's well regarded, very well regarded, um, but I think we should keep an eye on what the content of that discussion produces, the mill rate that it produces. Um, and if anything is removed from the plan, what was it? Uh, an excellent question. Uh, nevertheless, um, our representatives wanted us to uh, consider this um, a sign, actually a, a positive sign, that the political leadership of the region, 
uh, we're really uh, bearing down on this. Uh, maybe perhaps when they have time in between Amazon uh, headquarter proposal discussions, uh, they're also working on this. There's been a lot of discussion about Detroit and transit and the Amazon proposal uh, is definitely a part of that. So I think that was an interesting conversation. It confirms uh, what I know many of us have heard anecdotally. Um, on another level, um, I wanted to uh, let the board know that I believe the organization is beginning to function on a much higher level. Uh, this is somewhat anecdotal from my best professional judgment. Uh, one of the attractive elements of policy governance was the opportunity to uh, move faster towards achieving uh, the ends and outcomes that we want to do. I personally have noticed the decisive uptick in the velocity, uh, volume, and quality of work uh, that's being done at the administrative level. I believe may not be visible to you yet, uh, but it will be, I, I believe, sh within the next six to 12 months. As an example um, of sort of uh, the, the hose uh, moving faster, um, planning projects in the next couple weeks, we have our paratransit review project. Those proposals will be due on November the 1st. The retreat facilitator that Eric mentioned for your uh, planning or your retreat, uh, that RFP is due on November the 3rd. The fair study RFP is due on November the 17th. So that bucket's going to fill up really, really fast. Uh, Deputy CEO Metzinger has been uh, working with the finance committee uh, addressing uh, not just quarterly financial reports, not just investment policy, uh, but also large-scale reformatting of budgetary uh, issues, not, not to uh, forget the, the budget we, that we just passed. Uh, Deputy CEO uh, Smith uh, is working uh, on a number of issues internally, um, not the least of which are performance metrics, uh, liaisons with uh, some security issues that we've had recently. Um, uh, and, and other factors, and, and I'm keeping Sarah uh, very busy uh, with all of the policy governance uh, material, and we are barely keeping up with uh, the amount of material that we are required to provide to you. Personally, I feel like I'm sitting on a very rapidly inflating balloon. You signed uh, up for it, Brian. I did. Um, so it is, to me, I feel it, and I believe you will begin to see a decisive uptick, like I say, in the, uh, in the vol volume and quality of the information and work that the organization is doing. Um, and I want to commend all of my colleagues, um, including Karen, I'm not forgetting her. Um, uh, they are doing a very good job. Um, I feel that they're, the organization that we've uh, brought in is, is uh, allowing them to really reach their potential, and I'm very proud and satisfied with that. So those are my two additions that I wanted to provide. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions about the CEO report? Sean? Uh, it, it's not about anything that was verbally said. I just wanted to ask a, a question too about FlexRide. Um, so I, this might be a typo. It says ridership for a new service builds up in the first 12 to 24, and it's supposed to be months. Is that what that is? Uh, seconds. Months, <laughs> yes, I apologize. Okay, that is a typo. Okay, so my main question, though, about this is uh, what kind of marketing uh, is being done for something like this? It seems like aw awareness and marketing is going to be crucial for people to know about what FlexRide is. And we, well, it's pretty early to, to mm -hmm. say how it's going, but I'm just wondering what the outreach has been. I'll need to get back to you. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Any others? Okay. Uh, then we'll move on to item five, board development. 5A, governance policy monitoring. So um, last month I made the comment when we, I kind of sent out the mini survey, short survey about 3.0, uh, and were we in compliance? And um, uh, I thought, and I still feel, the tool was defective, and it took me a while to figure out why it was defective. And I thought it was defective because I got a, a lot of, I got a, a, the broadest cross-section of responses you could possibly get um, as to why we were and were not and uh, why people didn't know if we were or not in compliance with it. So I thought this, and it's, it was so 
broad as to not be really helpful as to terms like, well, here's what we can point to to say we can get back into compliance. Uh, the only, the only, I think it may not even be a, the fault of the tool, but this may be a flaw in the process, which is to say 3.0 is that general kind of overall statement about are we, a pro, you know, how are we governing ourselves. 3.0 as a policy is really interpreted by 3.1 through 3.8. Like when we put together 3.0, what we, you know, when we adopted 3.1 through 3.8, that was like, here's what we mean by 3.0, and that's that's how I see those sub policies being. They're, they're interpretive of 3.0. So I think we, in my mind, we went backwards, and we probably should interpret each one of the sub policies 3.1 through 3.8 evaluate them first and then that will tell us when and where we're out of compliance at 3.0. Um, so I think it was probably just an issue of timing um, and I meant to, I probably should have raised this when we were talking about the annual plan of work, but it might, we might have that backwards. So I mean we might start with, we might do instead of 3.0 first, we might do that last. And then 3.1 through 3.8 we can say yes, we're in compliance with 3.1 through 3.8. If we find that we're in compliance with all eight of those policies, then we can say, yes, we're in compliance with 3.0. But if we say, you know, we're not in compliance with 3.3 or 3.4, and I'm making that up, then we then I'll know where we're out of compliance with 3.0. Uh, as opposed to, you know, 3.0, um, you know, to me it, it, it was, it, it was, my mistake that we, I thought 3.0 was, it, it's not self-evident and I kind of realized this means different things to different people when I distributed it, um, but it was not explanatory or self-explanatory enough as to be actually helpful to the board members in terms of asking them are we in compliance. So I think it was a flaw of the process and we probably just have to flip the order in which we do these evaluations and save the general policy for last. So I think we're going to make that change going forward. Um, so there might be a slight amendment to the annual plan of work, and then and, um, we, we might flip that and then and do the sub policies first. So uh, I just wanted to mention that, and so that's why I think last time I said I was going to resend out a reconfigured survey, but I did not because I think I thought there's nothing wrong with the survey. I just think it's an issue of process and timing. So I uh, hope that's helpful. Uh, board education, <coughs> excuse me, the leading it with intent one. Um, I probably I'm going to have to punt on this one because I, I intended to come up with a good PowerPoint for this and I, I just didn't get around to it this month, so um, my mistake. But I, there is a lot of good stuff in there. It's a very dense. Um, well, Kyra has it here, and if, if Matt distributed this to all of us, uh, it's very dense with a lot of information. But there's a lot of good observations in there. Uh, and I had a, the intent to put together a PowerPoint that we could sit and discuss and maybe get some um, feedback from ourselves and dialogue about it in terms of uh, self-governing, but um, uh, I started it and didn't get around to finishing it, so I'm going to have to punt that to next month, uh, unless people are really disappointed and they want to have an off-the-cuff discussion about it. Uh, all right, so uh, item six then, emergent business. Any other emergent business that we wanted to discuss? Okay. Uh, item seven then, closing items, topics for next meeting. Is there anything anybody want to make sure got on the next one, Sue? Reading with intent. Reading with intent. Um, I've been s sitting and, and mulling over the discussion we had a few minutes ago um, on speaking for the board and it actually led me to think back to when we were um, in the RTA um, decision making process we had a lot of discussions as a board about our leadership role and so my thought process then went to okay we have board members who represent the ride but but maybe aren't speaking for the ride in places. We also have staff who are involved in many things and are viewed as representing the ride, but perhaps are not speaking for the ride, which therefore means that the decisions and the times that we um, vote to make statements might be really important. 
And when it comes to something like the EA, and I just use it as a friendly example, um, we haven't actually had a conversation as a board, at a board meeting, should the board have um, brought a resolution and voted to have a public statement as part of the public record. I know in a committee meeting we asked staff to speak, but in this new form of policy governance, how and when do we proactively look ahead at upcoming um, matters that, that might require or at least leave us an opportunity to have a discussion about if and when we should be speaking as a whole board on important topics. It's so very, that's very tough because you know, the, the, our representatives on other boards, Larry, Prashant, um, others, you know, often they don't get the agenda before we're going to meet again, right? So I mean, they, right. don't, they, they won't have a chance to come back to us and say, hey, this is coming up on my next meeting. Let's weigh in on it. Uh, often they'll get it, and and we won't. You know, the next time we hear about it is when they report out, right? Yep. So they don't have a chance. I just would it's like it struggle. on the agenda in the future because yeah. I think we ought to all talk about it. It's so a struggle. That we can think about what our leadership role is, and and if and when there are those topics, how we're thinking proactively. Okay. Thank you. Others? Uh, I would probably like to get, uh, I do intend to um, probably have some kind of millage report out on our next um, board meeting up agenda, um, particularly um, maybe some steps with fundraising or things like that and what that will take. Um, and I, I promised, but I did not deliver, uh, but we will uh, talk about CEO evaluation on the next one as well. So. Anything else from the board? Okay. Uh, public comment. Any other public comment for the record? It's item 7B. Uh, if not, uh, 7C, board assessment of the meeting. Anything anybody wants to change for next time? Throw in the trash? Do over again? Start, stop, continue? Can I have a motion to adjourn then? Oh. Jenny? Do you want me to come? Yep, come on up. <laughs> Sorry, I just was waiting for the motion. Yeah, so my name is Tim Hall. I introduced myself earlier. I just wanted to uh, address some things that weren't directly on the agenda because I know the beginning is supposed to be for agenda items, at least that's how it was. But anyway, I just interesting to hear this whole discussion about the board represent, re representatives on uh, c different boards and commissions because I was actually in the same position. I was representing the Commission on Disability Issues in the same board meeting. And I know that uh, this has come up in the past and I know that some boards have uh, representatives from others as ex officio non-voting members is a way to deal with this problem. I know that evident we, in this case, they are, they are voting members, but just something to think about. And uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is I know I was talking about uh, like the express bus service in North Campus. And I do think in my time back in a like of a year being back in Ann Arbor, I've been trying to use the transit system when I can, and the main thing I run into is frequency. Frequency, frequency, frequency. It's not enough. And I know that you have limited resources, but uh, I feel like uh, there's been this emphasis that, yeah, if you're going to or from downtown, central campus, or medical campus, we got tons of frequent service. If, if not, good luck. <laughs> it's and that's the way the system's been set up for years and that's the way it's always been but is that the only way and I feel like there needs to be some thought of how do we optimize our service is this the right configuration I know people have said yeah we've looked at a grid and for a city our size a grid isn't appro appropriate and we don't ha have but at the same point there's more than just a two-point hub and spoke system, 
and a grid. There is in-betweens. There are grid or hub and spoke systems with more hubs. And I think that needs to be looked at. In particular, North Campus, I feel like, is a very under underappreciate as far as the transit system seems to just overlook it quite a bit because there is no frequent AAA TA service on North Campus at all. It's all every 30 minutes or worse. And uh, that's a problem because if I miss a bus by one minute, I am not going to wait 29 minutes when I'm a working person for the next bus. I'm going to call an Uber or Lyft. That's just the way things are. Or I'm going to walk or I'm going to just something else <laughs> it's but yeah I, I feel like this and it, it gets compounded when transfers are involved because if you have two non-frequent routes and they're particularly if the transfers don't align it's like yeah I don't want to sit for 20 minutes at a transfer point and yeah just I do feel like yeah, there are limited resources, but this should be looked at. And I think the train station thing fits into this quite a bit because I know this discussion has come up, like Depot Street versus Fuller. And one of the big things is, yeah, you can run transit to Depot Street as they do now, but it's not frequent and it does not connect and it's got limited connections. Whereas I see on Fuller more opportunity for connections and serving other areas and frequency. and. Uh, that I feel like needs to be considered. I, I see like the issues with walkability. Yeah, that it's true that yeah, Depot Street might be a more urban, so as to speak, setting. But uh, at the same point, the transit accessibility ability looks to be perhaps greater at Fuller. And but I just wanted to give you some things to think about because I do would like to see the transit system be more useful to more people and not just downtown central campus medical campus which seems to be the like those are the three places that matter everywhere else like yeah it's like if you're not at least going to or from one of those three it's like yeah it's good luck and but yeah that that's what I want to say I will say I appreciate a lot of the work going on here just like talking about like these different issues and I think the RTA is definitely important because there needs to be something beyond Ann Arbor we can't just be an island and that's what we are in the current transportation network even our inner city buses like try to get to the UP on Indian trails buses uh, there's like a any way you do it there's a four-hour layover in Kalamazoo <laughs> <laughs> it's like just yeah we need to have a more cohesive network on a local basis on a regional southeast Michigan basis and statewide I mean which is things like Amtrak and private bus services and needs to all fit together I mean I guess sometimes the politics is why I mean it's the people in Lansing it's the people in Washington and yeah I have a, I could say a lot about both of those two but yeah just anyway uh, good work and uh, just wanted to address some of these issues I mean yeah okay my time's probably up and I just wanted to also mention, good work, like on the uh, Dick Nixon Green Duvarin, glad to see that that's done and working. I will notice that it seems like there are spots that used to have bus stops that don't have them anymore, or at least maybe they've moved to another side of the street, but that might be something to look at. Thank you. Okay. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention anybody who hasn't got their evaluations into me uh, please do that you know who you are uh, can I get a motion to adjourn Larry Jillian thank you all those in favor of adjournment raise your hand any opposed thank you we're adjourned